morning. I thought today we'd look at Psalm 52. Uh, let me share my screen with you, and then we will go straight to, I've, I've gone ahead and uh, copied and pasted the psalm here to a Word document. Um, <clears throat> for the choir director, this is a psalm, a mascal of David. Regarding the time Doeg, the Edomite, said to Saul, David is going to see Ahimelech. Why do you boast about your crimes, great warrior? Don't you realize God's justice continues forever? All day long you plot destruction. Your tongue cuts like a sharp razor. You're an expert at telling lies. You love evil more than good and lies more than truth. You love to destroy others with your words, you liar. But God will strike you down once and for all. He'll pull you from your home and uproot you from the land of the living. You will notice the two interludes, the two silas that divide this uh, psalm into three. The first five verses is really the first part. Now we start the second part. The righteous will see it and be amazed. They'll laugh and say, look what happens to mighty warriors who do not trust in God. They trust their wealth instead and grow more and more bold in their wickedness. But I'm like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. I will always trust in God's unfailing love. I will praise you forever, O God, for what you have done. I will trust in your good name, in the presence of your faithful people. So we're going to look here, and uh, the first thing that we notice is uh, the reference in uh, the comment, the title of the psalm, regarding the time Doeg, the Edomite, said to Saul, David is going to see Ahimelech. So uh, let's go back here to our uh, Bible gateway. And you may be like me. You might not know much about Doeg, the Edomite. So if we go back up here and just paste in Doeg, what we get is five passages that mention Doeg. 1 Samuel 21, 1 Samuel 22, 9, 22, 18, and then finally uh, Psalm 52. So let's take a look here at 1 Samuel 21, and let's read the full chapter there. We're not going to read the full chapter. What we will do is go back and get the context David went to the town of Nob to see Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he saw him. Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? The king sent me on a private matter. Now, if you remember what happens in 1 Samuel 21, David is fleeing after Saul tried to kill him in his home. So he doesn't tell Ahimelech what he's done. Um, David says, uh, give me five loaves of bread or anything else you have. The priest gives him holy bread. And uh, then David says, do you have a spear or a sword in verse 8? And he says, I only have the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. David says, that'll do. There's nothing like it. Give it to me. But here in verse 7, we get a couple of things about Doeg. Doeg, first of all, is not an Israelite. He is an Edomite. He's from the nation of Edom. Nevertheless, he is Saul's chief herdsman. He's Saul's chief shepherd. But he was in the tabernacle worshiping the Lord. He was there that day having been detained before the Lord. So we come down to chapter 22. 
And David hides in a cave and um, it is in uh, verse seven, Saul is looking for David. So he says, listen here, you men of Benjamin, Saul shouted to his officers when he heard that David was in Judah. Has the son of Jesse promised every one of you fields and vineyards? Has he promised to make you all generals and captains in his army? Is that why you've conspired against me? Not one of you have told me when my own son made a solemn pact with the son of Jesse. You're not even sorry for me. Think about my own son encouraging him to kill me as he's trying to do this very day. Then Doeg, the Edomite, here he is again, who was standing there with Saul's men, spoke up. When I was at Nob, he said, I saw the son of Jesse talking to the priest, Ahimelech, son of Ahitub. Ahimelech consulted the Lord for him, and he gave him food and the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Saul immediately sent for Ahimelech and all his family who served as priests at Nob. And Saul questions him after Ahimelech answers. And remember, David was not totally transparent with Ahimelech. He said he was on a private matter. He needed food and weapons. Ahimelech gave that to him. Saul said, uh, well, Ahimelech says, but sir, is anyone among all your servants as faithful as David, your son-in-law? He's the captain of your bodyguard, a highly honored member of your household. This was certainly not the first time I had consulted God for him. May the king not accuse me and my family in this matter, for I knew nothing at all of any plot against you. Saul shouts, you will surely die. He ordered his bodyguards, kill these priests. But Saul's men refused to kill the Lord's priest. So the king said to Doeg, you do it. So Doeg, here identified again as the Edomite, as one who is not an Israelite, turned on them and killed them that day. 85 priests in all, still wearing their priestly garments. Then he went to Nob, the town of the priests, and he killed the priest's family, men and women, children and babies. And he killed all the cattle, donkeys, sheep, and goats. Only Abiathar, one of the sons of Ahimelech, escaped and fled to David. When he told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord, David exclaimed, I knew it. When I saw Doeg the Edomite there that day, I knew he was sure to tell Saul. Now I've caused the death of all your father's family. Stay here with me and don't be afraid. I'll protect you with my own life for the same person wants to kill us both. And indeed, uh, for the rest of Abiathar's life, he was a priest uh, in David's service. Now, that gives us a great historical background for what's happening here. Notice what David says. Why do you boast about your crimes? Great warrior. And then later in verse seven, he refers to mighty warriors. So he calls Doeg a great warrior. Look at what he accuses him of. Your tongue cuts like a sharp razor. All day long you plot destruction. You love evil more than good and lies more than truth. Um, you love to destroy others but God will strike you down once and for all. When that happens, David says, the righteous will see it and be amazed. 
they'll laugh and say, look at what happens to mighty warriors who don't trust in God. They trust their wealth instead. They grow more and more bold in their wickedness. But I am like an olive tree. So what we get here is a contrast between uh, the mighty warrior and David. The mighty warrior trusts in his wealth. That's in verse 7. Um, David trusts in the Lord's mercy. That's his unfailing love. The mighty warrior uh, grows in wickedness. And again, that's verse 7. David is an olive tree. Now we're going to come back and look at that later. Um, we'll try to figure out why David uses that metaphor. I am like an olive tree. In fact, let's uh, just write that down here. Uh, so that we remember to come back and look at that. David goes into um, a great detail at what Doeg did. He plots destruction. His tongue cuts. He loves evil. He loves to destroy others. So in verses 1 to 3, he loves to, uh, actually, let's put down 1 to 4. He loves to destroy others. David, however, praises God and trusts in his good name. So there's quite a contrast between these two. Let's take a look at this metaphor. David is, is an olive tree. We'll go back here to uh, Psalm 52. Oops. There we go. And uh, we see David is like an olive olive tree. So we're going to copy that and we're going to plug that in up here at the top. We'll do a search and we see 31 references, uh, I believe all in the Old Testament, to olive trees. Let's just read through several of these. First mentioned in Deuteronomy, you'll eat from vineyards and olive trees that you didn't plant. Deuteronomy 8, the land of Palestine is a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines and fig trees and pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. 24, uh, these are uh, now just some laws governing um, the uh, harvesting of olives. Judges 9, 8, and 9. This is a parable that uh, the son of uh, Gideon uh, gave. 
And uh, he says, once upon a time, the trees decided to choose a king. So they said first to the olive tree, be our king. The olive tree refused. Now this seems to indicate that the olive tree was a prominent tree in Israel. First Chronicles 27 mentions the king's olive groves and sycamore fig trees. So olive trees and fig trees. Nehemiah 8, tell the people to go to the hills, get branches from olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees. Uh, Nehemiah 9, 25, cisterns that were dug, vineyards and olive groves, fruit trees in abundance. What we're seeing is that the olive tree is frequently mentioned uh, as prosperity as uh, a source of income, uh, as an indication of God's goodness to Israel. Uh, we have the passage we're looking at, Psalm 52, where David says, I am like an olive tree. Then again, in Psalm 128, he says, your children will be like olive trees as they sit around your table. In Isaiah chapter 17, uh, olives left on a tree, same thing in 24. Isaiah 41, I'll plant trees in the barren desert, and that includes olive trees. Jeremiah 11, 16 says, I, the Lord, once called them a thriving olive tree. That merits some attention. So let's just look at Jeremiah chapter 11. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, remind the people of Judah and Jerusalem about the terms of my covenant. He goes over several things that he's to do. The Lord says, broadcast this message. Uh, in verse 9, I have discovered a conspiracy against me uh, among the people of Judah and Jerusalem. They've returned to uh, the sins of their ancestors. And it's in this paragraph that David later says, um, verse 16, I, the Lord, once called them a thriving olive tree. God called the nation of Israel an olive tree. Why? It was beautiful to see, full of good fruit. But now they have disobeyed me. Now I've sent the fury of their enemies to burn them with fire, leaving them charred and broken. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, who planted this olive tree, have ordered it destroyed. Okay, we'll go back here to uh, where we were. In Hosea, again, we have references to the grapevine and the olive trees. Hosea 14, its branches will spread out like beautiful olive trees. Amos Locus has devoured your figs and your olive trees. Habakkuk, the fig trees, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, even though the olive crop fails, yet I will trust in you. Then in Haggai, I brought a drought to wither the grain, the grapes, and the olive trees. Again in Haggai, the fig trees, pomegranates, and the olive trees. Then in Zechariah, several references to the olive trees that we see. And this continues in the rest. There are two olive trees. Um, Jesus, of course, betrayed in uh, the Mount of Olives in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, several references to wild olive trees where the olive tree is Abraham and his children. 
uh, then in Revelation, again, referencing back to Zechariah, these two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. So what is it that we see here? Uh, olive tree refers to prosperity, to God's blessing. Uh, it refers to Israel. And to David, Israel's king. Back up in the psalm. I'm like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. Very different from the mighty warrior whom God will strike down. He'll pull you from your home and he will uproot you from the land of the living. Instead, David is an olive tree rooted in the house of God. So that's Psalm 52, an interesting psalm, um, refers to a specific historical case. But in that, we get a very clear message. Those who stand against God and his servants will be destroyed. God's servants, however, are rooted like olive trees, always producing, always uh, prospering in God's temple.